I'm Duncan Hunter. And I'm Duncan Hunter. And this is the Duncan Hunter Show. And we're joined today by not just my dad, who's a great congressman, but the former congressman, Bob Dornan, B1 Bob. And I remember campaigning for Bob Dornan many years ago. I think I was a teenager up in Orange County, California. He was a great fighter for freedom, uh, for Ronald Reagan, an anti-communist, and just an overall great American. Then you have me and Mark. Mark Dornan's on the show, who's Bob's son. I'm, I'm just the son of a congressman, too. But you guys probably have great stories about the 80s and 90s and actually having someone that you could fight because it was the evil empire. It, it was Russia. And, and I had that, too, with the Islamic State and, and radical Islam. It's always nice to have somebody that you can point a finger at, though, and, and go after him. And you and Bob did that with Ronald Reagan against the Soviets. Yeah, and we're seeing kind of a You and I, our that. fathers are, are our heroes. It's a great thing. Yeah, it really is. It's well, great to have heroes, and it's great to read about them. <laughs> and that's one reason we're doing this show today. We're talking about books, specifically banned books, burned books. And, and you as a teacher, Mark, you've got quite a story to tell. Um, yep. So let's talk about what, what happens when we stop learning through reading about our heroes here in America. Yep. So um, last summer, as I was packing my classroom, I work at a school that's middle school through high school. So middle school, 12, 13 years of age, all the way to 18 in the high school. So this one particular library serves all those students. So last summer, as I was packing my room, um, I was attracted to a 40-yard dumpster being dumped just outside my windows. I share a wall with the library. So throughout the afternoon, I hear all these things being tossed in the dumpster. That's not unusual. But at one point, I just hopped out my window, a little emergency window, just to take a look. And I walked up and looked in the dumpster, and I went, wow, look at that huge, beautiful, expensive coffee table book on Ireland. It's beautiful. I know, I'm Irish descent. I'm like, I want that. But I'm met by the librarian who says, what are you doing? What do you want? I said, well, I want that book that's in the dumpster. It's probably a $150 book at Barnes & Noble. She goes, well, um, you can't get in the dumpster. It's not allowed. And I said, okay, well, you're going to have to go home. And everyone goes home before I do. I'm the last one there. So at the end of the day, I jump in the dumpster. And lo and behold, there's practically the entire, well, surely, the entire Western civilization section of the library is in the dumpster intermixed with all the shelves and all the broken down bookshelves and titles on Western civilization, American biographies, World War One, World War Two, any country that is an all white, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, all those are gone. Any Norse culture, all gone. I went home, I got my son and my daughter, we drove back up to the school while the sun was going down, I sent you guys some pictures of us dumpster diving, and we could only get so much. I barely scratched what was in that dumpster because I thought, I'll get another hit at this tomorrow, it'll be a Friday afternoon, I'll have all Friday night to do this and Saturday. The dumpster was towed that morning while I was in first period. But I managed to get at least 300 plus books. My dining room now is a beautiful, expensive collection, courtesy of the taxpayers of upstate New York. I have all those books I could get. I have another maybe 20-some boxes still in my garage I haven't even unpacked yet. But these books were literally replaced by the brand new LGBTQA+, et cetera, section, adorned in rainbows. All the book stacks were shortened to five feet high, so all the displays are at eye level for a 12-year-old. And I was, you know, what could I have done? I could have, got, I could have probably raised enough hell at the board meeting and gotten a person fired, but that wasn't what I was about. What I needed to do was document what was going on and get as many books out of that dumpster as I could. But as we speak, the majority, I barely scratched the surface, the majority of the library section on Western civilization is literally in a dirt grave somewhere in New York outside of Poughkeepsie right now. So they didn't do a book burning, they did a, a book burying when it goes to the landfill. Is that, uh, and, and exactly what- right. It, it's heartbreaking. I just, I got what I could, but I, I just thought, you know, I don't even have room for it all, but I just, I took as many as I could. I literally filled a Toyota truck, I filled it up and over the top, and I used the shelves 
from the dumpster to build up the size of my truck so I could stack as many as I could. My son's got a beautiful library in his room. My daughter's got a library in her room. I turned our dining room into a library. And like I said, that was just a fraction of what went to the grave of American history. And so what these kids have lost is the ability to go in the, that section, which is the Western civilization section of the library. And if, if you're a kid who's, who's oriented toward, uh, toward the military and, and the patriotism and what uh, so many thousands of Americans have done for us and wearing the uniform, is they're not gonna be able to read about uh, Iwo Jima, Normandy, the Alamo, uh, the Western March of, of uh, uh, to the West Coast, the, the settling of America, all the great things that, that this country's done to become a light for the world, that's all erased now. But in a way, Mark, we can say that you saved at least a part of Western civilization. But they took this away from our children, and so they're going to they're gonna read about transgenderism. And I looked at some of these titles, uh, uh, you know, you've got, you went through some of them. I don't want to repeat them. Uh, okay. They're unmentionable uh, from my perspective, but, but they're, obviously, uh, they're obviously done to editorialize in favor of some very strange behavior uh, and what a lot of Americans uh, who follow the Judeo-Christian culture would find to be massively objectionable for their kids. That's, that has replaced the stories, the books, the sets uh, about the history of Western civilization, about what their forefathers did. They're not going to be able to read about what their forefathers did, uh, and they're not going to be able to have that, that pride or that anchor or that background. Uh, what a disservice to young people. Indeed. You know, how, so, uh, so as a history teacher at school, if I'm doing a unit on Manifest Destiny, and I want to know the players of Manifest Destiny. I want to know about uh, President Polk, say. I want to hear about, I want to read about the Mexican-American War. Here's what's killer about this. In the name of, you know, rejecting toxic masculinity, uh, these are what all these wars and all these toxic males did, instead of reading about President Polk and, and instead of reading about actual people that did things that really built and shaped our nation, I can't send a student to the library now to do independent research because they're met with the displays from, that lead you right to the, to the LGBTQ. Look, look, gay Americans are part of the fabric of America, but they are not a sole garment. The way that the thinking in New York schools is that they are the garment. It is now the garment, the fashion, the, the, the vogue. It is all of this. And these students, I'll tell you what gets me the worst. The real push, the full court press, is on the young girls more than the boys. Because you imagine with middle school and high school boys, you know, they're, they're more or less skeptical. They make fun of some things, and they're kind of inappropriate sometimes. But you know what? The push on the girls, it is a drive on the young women in the school. It's almost as if, you know, and I hear this. I hear Democrats saying that young single women are going to be their new uh, African-American voting bloc that they are now depending on these young women and new, vote, new women voters are going to pull them through the next election. They're using them as well. It's the, the irony of it all, the hypocrisy and hubris of it all. Bob, you've, you've, uh, you've gone through a lot, of, uh, a lot of eras. You know, I, 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 when uh, Mark and Duncan were introducing us, uh, what they were really talking about, I thought they were going to use the term relic when they spoke about us as, us as old politicians. But you've gone through... Uh, a, a number of eras uh, in your illustrious career. I've always thought of you as the, the guy who's got the best voice in show business and the best speaker in the House of Representatives, uh, maybe sometimes tied with the great Henry Hyde, uh, the father of, uh, of pro-life, along with you in my era. But what do you make of this, uh, of this transition, of this, of this massive focus on uh, on things that have nothing to do with American civilization. Well, let me uh, let me allude to what you said about Henry. Henry was a sailor in World War II. Even though he was only a few years older than I am, the difference between being 12 years old when the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima 
and being an 18-year-old sailor in the South Pacific, Henry Hyde, that six years to me was uh, a, a big chunk of history. So Henry Hyde used to call me kiddo, and I would tell him he was the best speaker in the house, and he said, oh no, I use notes on the floor, legal pads, you're all extemporaneous, you are. And so we would do like uh, a vaudeville team, I'd say, no you, Henry, no you, Bob, no you, Henry. So thank you for saying it, it was a tie, because Henry was our hero. Now, here's why this is all personal to me. I'm sitting here, and looking into our family room that I call the Knights Room, where you, where I showed you with uh, Sally, I showed you uh, four feathers, and you know that we were surrounded by books. I have a home that is being overtaken by books. I've always been enthralled with the fact that the Library of Congress, the greatest library in the world, was started with Thomas Jefferson's 3,000 basic books that he donated to the government when he was president. And that Library of Congress is filled with books that they are putting in dumpsters. And it just got personal to me because Mark's daughter, Mary, sent us the photographs that Mark took in the dumpster and afterward, and one of them is Western Civilization. Now let me tell you who's on the cover of that book. This is a book not covered in leather, but a lot of the ones that Mark rescued are. Eastern Press has a, uh, they put out books with gold tinted edges and with real leather or leather red covers. And this one has Alexander the Great on the cover. So that's where they start teaching with Socrates, teaching uh, Plato, who teaches Aristotle, who becomes a tutor of Alexander the Great. We start with Greek philosophy, that St. Thomas Aquinas based a lot of his great, greatest theological writing in the biggest Christian religion in the world. And here they are throwing Alexander the Great and 24 centuries of history that really colonized the whole world, another bad word, and it's in the dumpster with gold-edged pages and leather covers. I mean, it's like somebody came into my home and took my entire library and threw it out and then handed me uh, Heather has two daddies or but something. But, Dad, that's okay, because you can still go in and read about a transsexual teenage love affair on the island of Nantucket in the summer of 2020. Well, Bob, here's my uh, question for you uh, for you guys. Anyway, here's a question, though, Bob. Can you imagine you and I Bob. battering this around, uh, Little D? Can you imagine watching your father and I do a special order in Congress? We would blow the roof off that distinguished... Uh, our House of, of Commons, the People's House, the House of Reps. I mean, I can't believe. Look, l let me turn it back to you guys with one statement. I would need a thesaurus to try and describe, we talked about this the other day, Douglas Senior, about how to describe the difference between when you and I left that house. Some of my best friends, it sounds like a cliche, but it was Lester Wolf, the Narcotics Committee that I was on for 14 years, Select Committee on Narcotics view, uh, Abuse and Control. It's destroying our country with Biden's open border. There's enough fentanyl collected just this year to kill every single American, 340 million people, twice over. And the, the Bidens are acting like it's no big deal, this open border. We are looking at a situation in America so unprecedented. Uh, Byron York has a great column, just Google it on Washington Examiner today, that says not only is everything unprecedented, it is big, 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 four bigs unprecedented. You, it's, it's the word, the, go to the source. It's astounding. It's horrifying, unprecedented, mind-blowing, what the British would call... Uh, I want some of what God smacked him. or whatever that weird term is. God slap. God, God slap. Sounds like God, God smack. That's a good band. Unbelievable what's happening.
happening to our country right in front of our eyes. And I had one of my uh, daughter's neighbors come over at my 90th birthday party at San Juan Capistrano and say, Congressman, have you ever, no, did you ever think you would see it get this bad? And although I'm very loquacious, I looked at her with no answer and I said, let me answer slowly, Valerie. I never, ever conceived that it would get this bad, ever. Hey, can you guys hear me? Bob and Mark, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear us? Yeah, loud, loud and clear. Let me ask you a question. Why do leftists hate Western civilization? We've, we've talked about what they've done. Why do you think that is? Well, this is all part what I experienced with co-teachers. So I, unfortunately, you know, I'm a, a special educator. As a special educator, I teach English and I teach uh, social studies history. So I am uh, forced now because, you know, the, uh, they just want to include as many students. Um, so I am forced now to work with other teachers and co-teach models. And I am blown away at the straight up wrong history that's taught. Everything is couched in terms of colonialism, patriarchy, uh, white, uh, white culture having created, invented, perpetrated, and continue to perpetrate uh, slavery. Uh, don't dare speak of the white slave trade. That's uh, not to be spoken of. Martin Luther King Jr. now is pushed to the periphery while BLM activists, billions of dollars of destruction to black-owned businesses, uh, 20-plus uh, murders in the streets because of these, those are all celebrated. Um, it's, look, as a teacher, there's something, there's something in every state. It's called a FAPE, a free and appropriate public education. Is this appropriate? Surely it isn't appropriate. So this idea that everything is this patriarchal, this is the problem, this is what they did to us, and so we play this game in classrooms of victimization. This, it is this racism of low expectations. And so what they put in there instead are, is just this almost fad like, look, imagine doing this. Imagine if they had a whole section on experimenting with drugs as a teenager. Experiments, and you know, that's what we are quite literally talking about. Because in some of these books on transitioning, they're talking about using the same castration injections that they use to kill inmates who, uh, who uh, have capital punishment sentences. So it is that in a way. But imagine if in the 60s, with Timothy Leary and everything, if they had an entire section dedicated to get out there, uh, tune in, turn on, drop out, and kids, let's get out there, 12-year-olds, and experiment with drugs. And would imagine a whole altar of that for children back in the 60s. It's similar to me. I mean, if I tell a kid, like I said, if I try to send a child to go study something that we just covered in a unit, here's a good example. Here's the, the hubris of it all. The left, they'll say, look, we've got to get rid of all this white patriarchal crap. All the American Revolution books are thrown away. Thrown away. Then why throw away Civil War books? Don't you want us to learn about slavery? Don't you want students to understand about the cottonocracy in the South? So here's what they miss. Students don't get to read about a general named von Steuben who was kicked out of the Prussian army for being gay. It's an amazing story. He happened to be gay. Washington took him on. He literally trained our, our fighting force to be a formidable force. They drilled and drilled. Von Steuben fixed the camp. He separated the kitchen from where the latrines were. He marched. He drilled. And he made us a fighting force to pull up a miracle, fighting the largest, most experienced force on the planet Earth, the British. So we lose, there's a, a story of a gay human being in history that is now lost in the name of this weird new wokeness. Or how about why they yell and scream about anti-Semitism while Elon Omar is a rabid anti-Semite. We don't learn about the anti-Semitism of FDR, but we are now denied, you won't read about Ham Solomon who is the Jewish financier in Pennsylvania of the Revolutionary War. We won't let you read about them. Just listen to our diatribe. Say his name again. Our, uh, Ham. Ham. Ham is Solomon. Ham, one of the sons of Noah. Right. So instead, listen to our diatribe. Listen to our liberal theology. It's, I, I feel 
I, I'm so close, 23 years in, in teaching now, I, and I taught in California, I taught in Orange County, Los Angeles County, and I'm now at this point where I, I just want to retire because I feel complicit, because, you know, the union will not back me up. I'm surrounded up in that place, I, quite literally, but I went from one blue state in California to another when I decided to move to uh, New York, and I did that for my kids just to get out of L.A. I didn't know it was going to chase me. I didn't even think, I did not even think that the immigration struggle was going to chase me living very close to where you guys were almost right at that border and i thought well that's another thing i'm watching everything get dumbed down i did not teach to a white face for the first nine years of my career till I, and then i moved to new york and now i have a nice mix going there but now it's all around it is just swept across the country but now it's like you can't put this genie well, mark, back in the bottle. Mark, what this sounds like, it's, it sounds like you're describing college for the last, uh, you know, 60 years. But what, what's happened is the leftists have pushed the college uh, curriculum and what, what they're trying, what, what they've been able to inculcate in, in people since the 1960s. And that's socialism, Marxism, leftism, America's bad. They've, they've now pushed that down to the elementary schools. And that's why you have states like... Yeah. States like Florida and Texas and Utah, but mostly Florida and Texas, pushing back and and starting to ban some of the books that are not appropriate. But but from what I've seen, what the left then does is ban books that they deem inappropriate be, because of white supremacy, colonialism, or any other ism that happens to offend them. So it, it's kind of a back and forth right now, according to whatever the state legislatures decide to do. So, so uh, uh, Hunter Sr. here, you know, one, one point is I, I looked at uh, some of these titles that you saved, Mark. Yeah. And one of them is entitled Latin American History and Culture. So this was a wholesale gutting of Western civilization, and it took along some collateral damage. You, meant, you mentioned that a lot of the, the resentment against Western civilization was the fact that uh, a lot of it was accomplished by people whose skin was white. Well, here's the Latin American history and culture also being thrown out of that. Uh, and, and they, and as I understand it, you said they gutted, they gutted the entire Western civilization section of the library. So you've got kids who, when they, when they want to have that, that memory, that knowledge, that background from a historical sense, They've got a black, a blank page. That's it. And if you're a Latino student and you want to go learn about some Latino American heroes to feel a little pride in your heritage, you are met with a book about a teenage love affair, in, you know, in Cape Cod in some summer. I mean, that's that's what you have. And I'll tell you, every year begins now with this new section when we do our little dog and pony show from the library, you know, hey, where are your resources? I would say out of a 42 minute period, 30 minutes is spent on presenting the LGBTQA plus section. Wow. Uh, Duncan, uh, an overall observation here. Uh, there was an Academy nominated film a few years ago, No Country for Old Men, Tommy Lee Jones, yeah. an ending. When after all of this horrible uh, drug film, uh, uh, the uh, Josh, uh, what's the guy, Brolin, uh, made him a star. And uh, I thought at the end of that movie when he said to his wife, a retired sheriff, this is no country for old men. I wonder if you and Duncan Jr., and uh, I haven't gotten an observation from Mark. I don't think I called him up in New York in the Catskills uh on the 4th of July, but this 4th of July, for the first time in my life, I felt, why is our country now split so that half of our country almost, even if it's 40, 35 percent, it's a tragedy, think the 4th of July is a celebration of colonialism, white oppression, and Judeo-Christianity uh, crushing a culture. I have this feeling that people, and around the country, people were saying, I don't watch the fireworks. What are we celebrating, slavery? 
because our forefathers and and they're tearing down Saint Unipra Sarah and Thomas Jefferson and in our own DC where you and I served a quarter of our lives they are take down a statue of Lincoln uh, that was paid for by the money from freed slaves because he's sitting in a chair and the black people that he's liberated are not in a chair next to him. Or I get this, I'll close on this. I walked to school for the third, fourth, and fifth grade on Central Park West. I walked out the door of 75 Central Park West. There's a park in front of me. I take a left turn, and within four blocks, I'm in front of the American History, the Museum of, of American History. And in front of it is a big statue of Teddy Roosevelt, one of my boyhood heroes. How many times did you and I quote on the floor, it's not the critic, it's the man in the arena, that great uh, 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 writing of Teddy Roosevelt. The man in the, in the arena was taking all the scars. And I would look around the house and say, this is our arena right here. This is our Teddy Roosevelt moment. And he has a handsome black freed slave on one side, walking proudly, chest puffed up, and on the other side, a handsome, ab, six-pack abs, American Indian, as handsome as a black guy, walking proudly on his other side. But because Roosevelt is on a horse, even though the whole statue screams out to me as a seven, eight, nine, and ten year old that this is the man who who did everything he could for the Native Americans and for uh, America uh, that, that were brought here from Africa as slaves and then born here for 300 gener years of generations, and they take his statue down from in front of the National Museum of American History and hide it in the back somewhere. It's just unbelievable, the assault on basic patrons. Mark has a picture up here on his uh, laptop of, of uh, Americans all look like a football team all piled on a, on a hilltop. And it's as beautiful as Iwo Jima because they're all looking at you and it's like a graduation photograph. It's not Iwo Jima, it's Okinawa. It could have been D-Day. Well, when, uh, I remember when Sally, I took Sally and our, my whole family in San Juan Capistrano to see Saving Private Ryan. And when that opening finished, nobody will ever equal Spielberg's opening. The sound of the bullets hitting the tank traps in the, in the sand. And I, I said, I started crying, physically tears running down my face. And Sally says, what's wrong? I said, these young farm boys did not die to see a creep like Bill Clinton as president of this country. And that opening of Saturday Night Live is now, of uh, Saturday Night Live, of Saving Private Ryan, it's now being attacked all across this country by the radicalized left of the dominant political system in our country. Well, the only thing you're not gonna find from the uh, Democrat Party and from the left uh, is any history about the Republican Party uh, and if you ask a, a uh, if you ask the average, the average 18 year old, uh, which party uh, uh, freed the slaves? Which party uh, debated on the side of emancipation? Which party did Abraham Lincoln belong to? And which yeah, party I, did he found? That's one I piece of information that you'll never be you given. That, Congressman. I literally, first thing I do is this assessment of students uh, some of these ninth graders, right? And I want to know what they got in the seventh and the eighth grade. I teach those grades as well. He and I just said, told me the just, story I just again told, tonight. I just told my dad the story. Exactly what you just said, Duncan, was, you know, I say, all right, students, there was a president, and uh, he, uh, you know about emancipation of black Americans, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we know, we know. I go, okay. Was Lincoln a Democrat or a Republican? I am not kidding when I tell you this. They all punch it into their little, like, little Google survey we do with our Chromebooks. Everything's technology. Um, thank you, Bill Gates. But they all type in Democrat. And that's my, my, uh, that is my entree to the whole thing. So when I sit in meetings and we do they professional think, no, let me get this straight. Here, the they thing. say that the fa teacher Now, hold on, Mark. Go Mark, ahead. This, yeah. Mark, this is important. The, you, most of your students think that the founder of the Republican Party 
That's Abraham Lincoln was really a Democrat. Right, exactly. And worse is this. This, when, when I sit at nauseam meetings of your implicit bias, don't let your bias, no bias, all the, my fellow, all my colleague teachers, with the exception of a handful of real, like, real courageous patriotic teachers teaching the truth, they all take that to mean, oh, we're talking about right-wing bias. We can go on with our stuff. So I have embarked in my class of teaching students that Democrats, the party of slavery, I know the North benefited, but they are the cottonocracy. They wove it into their very societal being, that they are the party of slavery, the party of the KKK, the party of Jim Crow, the party of black codes, the party of Black Wall Street. They are the party. Why, when I drove here, did I drive over the Woodrow Wilson Bridge? Why is it still named after a racist president who showed birth of a nation D.W. Griffith, this birth of a nation where the KKK of the heroes to all of his Hollywood celebrity and political celebrity friends in the White House. Why is that still named Woodrow Wilson? Why is Teddy Roosevelt progressive? Why is he taken down? Why is Woodrow Wilson's bridge, why is that still a thing? Why, are, why is every statue torn down with the exception of Teddy Roosevelt, a Democrat? All those statues ripped down, Democrats, except for some idiots who didn't know who Lincoln was and tore his statue down in Illinois. And was like, what are you guys doing? And defaced it and painted it red. But so when I do that, I had a teacher come to me and she said, why, a parent called, why are you talking about the KKK in your class? I go, what do you mean? Well, first of all, that question's so strange. Why wouldn't I talk about the KKK? But that weird leftist feeling is, well, you must be speaking of it in positive terms. Like, who would ever do that? I mean... What are you talking about? I'm trying, I was discussing the KKK, what I just told you, and how a president, Woodrow Wilson, that they're taught, that was this this wonderful guy, is a guy who was showing birth of a nation. I also, when Coca-Cola came out with that comment on Twitter last year and said, be less white, I pulled up some old photos, sepia photos, of Coca-Cola sponsoring KKK rallies. In the South, they were the sponsor. They made sure that all those racist thirsts were quenched. So I said, to this, "I said, come here. I'll show you what we're doing." She goes, "Why do you have a Why do you have an eight by ten picture of a KKK banner?" I go, "Look closely. It says Coca Cola welcomes you, and right next to it is the tweet from Coca Cola Company: Be less white." You know that so that, that hey that students, why? The Mark Mark, we've missed the personality. The as I recall, uh, at least the, the, the information that I have is there was another great president, his name was Dwight Eisenhower, who, who enforced the first integration in Alabama, who had, had American troops escort a little girl yep. to, her, to her grade school classes. That was Republican yep. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, now you might you might inject him into the quiz that you asked your students. Was he Democrat or Republican? You know what? This cultural meltdown. I, that is good, and of course, you know I will do that, and I'll take that advice. But you know what? They'll be able to tell me what YouTube influencer dumped Orbeez in his Malibu pool and, and bought you know ten thousand Orby little gel caps from China and dumped them in his pool and jumped in, and all the students will hit that up a million views. But they won't even know who Eisenhower is. Well, welcome to Nobody kids. Hey, but I will you do guys. That, you guys sound like you're about 90 years old. Well, I guess Bob is 90 years old, but hey, I mean, you, you guys sound like every old guy in the Happy last birthday, thousand Bob. years. Uh, Happy I'm birthday, Bob. Uh, this uh, farmer, philosopher, classical historian, uh, emeritus teacher from both Stanford and uh, the California State uh, System, uh, uh, with, he's got a triple name, Victor Davis Hansen. Hansen with an O-N, a Swedish Hansen. He is so brilliant, and he said the other day, he wrote a great article in the country's greatest new newspaper, the Epic Times. He said, when you have kids that don't know what Yorktown or Gettysburg, Antietam, Normandy, or what a B-29 is, they, they don't know anything about American history and what, and they got to be taught something, so what is the basic public school system across this country? What is it they're teaching? I remember 
Sally came in and woke me up one morning at 7 o'clock and said, the president is on the phone. And my younger brother, Mark's Uncle Dick, at that time did a great Jimmy Carter. So I pick up the phone. I'm still lying down in bed. And it says, uh, a Congressman, this is Jimmy Carter. No president. She said, I said, nice impersonation, Dick. It's getting better. No, no. Uh, uh, Bob, this really is Jimmy Carter. And I, I, I jumped out of bed and stood at attention. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. And he said, I was hoping, Congressman, you could support me in uh, making a cabinet seat for education. I said, oh, Mr. President, I am so honored that you would call me. I think I told him I'm standing at attention. And I said, but I can't, sir. Education must be local. We don't need one size fits all. If you get the federal government involved in education, it's bad enough at the state level. I pay property taxes for schooling at the county level. And I'm doing the same thing in Virginia now with my county property taxes. I said, it's got to be closer to the people where they can go to a school board meeting. Footnote, look at what they're doing to parents who get active. This woman screamed the other day at NEA, these are our babies. That's a verbatim quote. She screams at the cameras in this audience, these are our babies, meaning not the parents' babies. And I, I turned him down and I said, but Mr. President, don't give up, call me. And he called me again for the energy department. And I said, no, I don't want the energy department which has our nuclear weapons uh, stockpile. I said, I don't want them to be a cabinet job. I want them to answer to the Defense Department at the Pentagon. But I turned him down twice. I said yes to Bush Sr.'s Veterans Affairs. But uh, education should not be a federal issue. It should be as close to the parents who have the obligation under any religion worth the name. The parents are the main responsibility for educating their kids. And if they want to educate them in Western civilization, there should be a great leather or leatherette section in their library with all the great accomplishments and sins and mistakes sure. of Western civilization. Well, yep. well, Bob, here's the interesting point with these uh, book bans is that they are not national. There's, there's, no, there's no Democrat in Congress who's banned any books. Um, Ocasio-Cortez has not banned any books. We, we can't yell at Nancy Pelosi for banning books. The majority of these books are banned at the lo local level by the school board, by the city council, by the county supervisors. So this is a local problem. This is one of those problems that as a congressman, I could look at the person and say, I'm on your side, but I have no say in this because this is local, which means it should be theoretically easier to fix. So how do we you know, fix it? I was thinking of another another time that a, a parent was outraged that I had commented because the student was asking about reparations and things for black Americans. And I said, look, if any reparations are to be paid, you're not going to be able to get any money out of any African countries that any African countries that, that did this. So if you're going to look at America for reparations, the music industry, Hollywood, and the Democrat Party should be paying reparations to black Americans. And they have deep pockets. And I guess this student's uh, father was in the music industry. He was very offended. But I said, no, the theft of intellectual property of black entertainers, the way Hollywood depicted black Americans for years and years and years, so you couldn't even find a black person in a movie for a long time. And if you did, it was some stereotypical thing. And that's the same Hollywood that portrays gay people as the other. This hypocrisy in Hollywood. Oh, let's see what these people do in this situation. It's a modern day minstrel show. So they keep stepping on it. I have to do social emotional learning circles, translate CRT, where you get the students and you try to put out that, that whole like anti-white vibe in some kind of Native American circle with a talking piece. And it's all touchy feely. And I went to a training and I was told by this wiry, gray-haired, very old-school liberal leftist woman in my training. Tomorrow, when we do SEL circles, you will tell your students that if you are black or brown, you cannot be racist. And I was the only teacher in the training, in the auditorium, and I stood up and I oh said, that's offensive, and I won't do it. 
I have academic freedom, I won't do it. Good the next morning, I was met at my door when it was SEL Circle, Social Emotional Learning Time, and I was met by the principal and this facilitator from Brooklyn. And they wanted to sit in, in my circle. And I used their language. I said, I don't feel safe. I don't think it's good. I, I think it's disruptive, and I don't feel safe for you to be here today. And they looked at each other like, damn, he knows the language. And they walked down the hall. That's great. That's what I'm surrounded with. Way That's to turn what it modern on. Modern education is. Well, Way listen, hey, hey, hey Mark. It. Mark, thanks for saving at least one third of Western civilization. But, but just a bit, and just to make this clear uh, for our, our audience, they didn't go through and pick out a, a book here or a book there on a specific reason. They took the entire library section that was Western civilization and trashed it and took it to the dumpster. It was a sweep, and their justification yeah, is, so, well, the, so that, what that did, in here. You that, all have a Chromebook. You that all left a blank space. You can look for it. It's like, well, why don't you reverse that? We are an American public school. We'll leave those books there that the taxpayers pay for. And if students feel so, they can use that window to the world to search out their identity with the, window, with, with the world at their fingertips. But it's what's in front of these kids' faces. Just like I said, the Marlboro ads that are eye level to a kid in a liquor store, liquors that are scented and flavored for children, sour apple, all that, those are all at eye level for a child, like a candy, uh, candy shelf. So we take away the, the everyday experiences, guaranteed every day you're gonna see these books right when you walk in. And they're in glass cases, they're on top of the stacks. It's, it's a celebration of something that's going on in our country. Well, everybody's is, offended by everything and everybody's now categorized, everybody is something else and themselves. So yeah. un, until we're post categorization, where we drop all labels completely, this isn't going away. And this is kind of right. why you, you have such polarization in the United States too. In fact, around the world. I mean, this is a this is a huge deal that's not going away as long as people continue to think that they're victims, uh, and, and they they keep labeling themselves and others. We just need to be humans, and it's not going to happen until um, kids stop being taught to be victims. Because you have to be taught to be a victim. Yes. Right. Yes. You know, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, really has been pushed by the left. They use it to attack uh, Trump when he was president. They're using it on DeSantis all the time. That weird show, uh, The View on ABC, owned by Disney, they do it every week. They claim that the right is involved in book burning because DeSantis wanted to take hardcore pornography out of some of the school program in Florida and overwhelmingly the Senate and the House of Reps in Florida passed the legislation that DeSantis encouraged, and he signed it. And they took, they didn't put the books into the system or kept them out, so they want to conjure up a Hitler book burning at Nuremberg, so they call it book burning. I was thinking the other day and told Mark, the biggest book burning in the history of the United States of America was in the middle of the last century when they took the Bibles out of public schools. They had so many millions of Bibles, they didn't know what to do. They didn't want to store them. They literally burned them. That's the biggest book burning in the history of the United States. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John going up in flames because they took the foundation of Western civilization, Western Christianity, they took it out of the school system, and now we're wondering why all these kids are engaged in all these violent crimes, and you go back to basics, we stop teaching them right and wrong. The Ten Commandments, when they were taken off the walls of every public grade school and high school in this country, when we took the Ten Commandment tablets off the lawn of every of, of nine out of ten uh, state uh, courthouses or state uh, legislatures across this country, we stopped teaching kids right from wrong. They don't have any rule of thumb. They don't 
even have the golden rule anymore of treat of, of love God and treat your neighbor as yourself. And then we wonder why the kids are uh, engaged in, in carjackings and violence and killing one another. In Chicago, the main murdering is of one another. Uh, teens killing teens. Yep. Hey, hey, Bob. But one thing about it, uh, there has been there have been book burnings, and of course we have the we have the uh, the the great example that some people know about, which is the 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 burnings in Germany. But what we really had here at Mark School was a book burying. I take it that that the, these dumpsters, when they took this entire section of Western civilization to basically hand a blank page to kids that wanted to read about where they came from and Western civilization and what their forefathers did. They took those, put them in the dumpsters, and the ones that Mark did not save, that entire section, was taken probably to a landfill. So I guess it would, it would be more appropriate to refer to that as a book burying rather than Absolutely. a book burning. But Mark, could you find out if they actually burned the Western civilization section of your school, or if they merely buried it in the uh, landfill? You know, I know that, you know, that's a good question. If this, if the particular uh, w uh, landfill that this goes to, um, the waste transfer, does it go to one of those incinerator type, like outside of DC is Lorton, it's a massive incinerator. You've driven by it a million yeah. times, both of you. And, you know, it's that massive incinerator. So that would be interesting to find out. Look, while they're, while they're burying the, our Western civilization and what made our country great, when they get rid of books on Greece and Rome and these, and these roots of democracy, so would students sort of, you know, where they come from, what their purpose is, and, this, and while they're doing that, as I told you, we have this thing called Social Emotional Learning Circles. It is sponsored by the Taxpayers of New York Pay, a group called Morningside in New York. Morningside is a subsidiary funded by Open Society. That's George Soros who funds by himself Open Society. That is the book, when you go into the curriculum, and anyone could find this, if you find this Morningside Social Emotional Learning, you can find the curriculum. And I'm not kidding you, as you, it starts soft, you know, and it's, it's very graceful about Native American culture and how they would sit in a circle and the purposes, and that's all very nice to bring a class together in that classroom management. However, as you get into chapter 10 and 11, how's this one? A discussion with the family of Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake was that man who jumped, holding the karambit fighting knife, was jumping into that red Ford Explorer with children in the back when that fi officer fired on him and paralyzed him. And they tried to bring him up on federal charges for that. And that went nowhere because it was a justified shooting. Imagine that. We're supposed to have students in a group where we have a discussion with the family of Jacob Blake, the perpetrator. Then, worse yet, Another chapter on a discussion with the family of Michael Brown and the narrative, just like Jacob Blake narrative, a straight up George Soros open society lie that Michael Brown had his hands up saying, don't shoot, and he got shot and killed. Not that he grabbed an officer's weapon, not that he was half in the officer's car, not that he put his head down and charged him like a bull. This is the crap that they want me to teach. And again, I said, nope, I have an alternative lesson and I move on to something else. And my only defense is academic freedom. But there's pushback on the union. They don't help me. I gotta say, I'm really considering not paying those dues for a while. But you know what, Duncan, I think I'm gonna take it, some advice from you. You said, why don't you take your last five years and just, you know, be an activist. I really have no problem working hard to get myself fired over the next few years. There'll be a subsequent lawsuit and uh, they can pay for my retirement early. But I'm telling you, it's that bad. I feel complicit. My wife, every day, she goes, what has happened? I go, it's not just because of COVID, but let me tell you, the money that flowed with COVID was all spent on these programs. The taxpayers in New York do not know what they're paying for, what's going on. They got a hint when we had uh, remote learning, but teachers were on their best behavior. Trust me, I was in those classrooms. I'm like, wow, you didn't say that in the last unit last year before COVID. You've changed yourself up because now you know parents are listening in the kitchens with their kids in the morning. So all of this funding flowed in. It all went to these crap programs. But I feel 
I really do feel complicit, and all I can do is pick these fights with teachers, pick these fights with students that are absolutely brainwashed, that celebrate socialism, Marxism. They all wear their Che Guevara T-shirts, not even believing that he was a homophobe and a racist and a murderer. They're completely turned upside down. They don't well, know Hey, anything. Hey, Mark, you, you just consider this a blessing that you've got this opportunity uh, to, to uh, be an activist and to do something about this. So, so uh, the school I, systems turned him into a revolutionary. It is. <laughs> right? This is a, yeah, hey, you got a lot of, right. Mark, you right. got a lot, you got a lot of work in front of you. And, uh, but what a, what a tragedy that American kids, that this country, the greatest country in the history of the world, uh, the country that, that when we won a war, when we win wars, we go in, we reach out our hand and we lift up the defeated country. Uh, rather than uh, demand reparations or oppression of, of the defeated people. Uh, we're the nation that, that lifts people up. We're the nation that saved Europe twice for freedom in the last century. Uh, we're the nation that gives more to, to good causes around the world than all the rest of the people in the world combined. This is a fabulous, great, wonderful nation. And the idea that our youngsters are denied when they go in to look to read about Western civilization, which in, includes in large part American civilization, they're met with a blank page and they, they're met with a void. So there's, there's no reason to them going in and gutting the Western civilization li library. This isn't one or two books that somebody found a problem with. This is all attitudinal. This was, yeah. a, this was done by people that hate our country that, that want nothing to do with the history of the United States, the country that gave them prosperity and gave them freedom and gave them an opportunity to teach kids. So, hey, you're a lone wolf out there. Uh, you're gonna have to fight this battle largely by yourself in your own position. But my recommendation is to fight it and, and to go out and, uh, and take them on. And you know something? I think you'll find a lot of allies in the families of these children who are being denied a real education. Yep, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm inspired. You know, I absolutely. I just, I intend to do these last five years. The very, uh, I'm already rethinking units and how I'm going to turn them. It looks like I'm going to end up with the most liberal history teacher as a co-teacher in this room. They pushed me with special ed a cohort of students into that room, and he's notorious. Um, and it's about time to, uh, I made his life so uncomfortable two years ago, two and a half years ago, that he went to the administrators and asked not to have me in his class because he would say things to children. What America did to Native Americans, what we did to them, putting smallpox in blankets. And I go, oh, stop right there, Mr. So-and-so. That was not America. We weren't even America. That was the French and Indian War, 1763. That was a British general did that, and he sent blankets outside the fort. That was not America and America's name doing that in the name of America. We weren't even America yet. And you're a history teacher, and you should know that. He was so offended. And I said, well, by the way, Andrew Jackson, the Trail of Tears, Democrat, I go, when are we just going to just say it the way it is? Every time it's something decent that you can put a Democrat on, he will say that. Anything decent, like you said, Eisenhower, leave it out, leave it out. But I always interject, 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 and it drove him insane. So he finally went to ministers, and he got his way. Oh, we can't have that. we got to have you running solo in there. We can't have him interjecting the truth. Let's well, just well, keep listen, going with this. Mark, you've got to— I tell my students, by the time you leave this high school, a lot of you are going to not like your country as much as you do now. You well, will be Mark, you've got a challenge. Country, that we are what's wrong with the world. You've and got a challenge. come back to me and go, damn, it's happening. I'm, I'm in the senior, doing my senior thesis. They're pushing all this crap on us. Mm -hmm. Oh, that young girl that came back to you, Mark, that oh, said, yeah. yep. uh, Mark, uh, but no, Mr. Dornan, I want to thank you for teaching me that when I got to advanced education, they were going to teach me, try and teach me to hate my country. And it's happening to me, Mr. Dornan. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah. Well, Mark and, and Bob, thank you guys for being leaders on, on so many issues. And Mark, you're, you, you've got a, a great father to, yep. to learn from and talk to because he was a revolutionary back in his day. My dad was a revolutionary, and now it's right. your turn. I got you, right. And, and, and we're, we're glad that you're in our, our corner. I'm Duncan Hunter. And I'm Duncan Hunter. And this has been the Duncan Hunter Show. Stay tuned for more.